usually gives me my love. There it is. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, and bienvenidos. I am so, so excited, overjoyed, um, beyond, beyond uh, excitement to welcome you tonight to our special edition from Cove, Ireland, formerly known as Queenstown, which was Titanic's last port of call in 1912. And tonight on the 112th anniversary, we are having our Titanic commemoration where you, where our featured readers will be sharing poems inspired by Titanic or the location that Titanic has, uh, where Titanic has been um, and maritime things in general. Uh, we have an amazing group of featured readers uh, and, and then of course, all of you on the open mic. Um, this is, we're having such an incredible outpouring of folks uh, reaching out to us and telling us how excited they are to be watching our journey. And of course, as you know, um, uh, I'm Sandy, you know, and your host for tonight. And um, I'm the author of Boats for Women from Salmon Poetry here out of Ireland and Anna Steinman. And that book is in part um, related to the Titanic disaster of 1912. So this reading is very significant personally to me in terms of it's my obsession um and um of course to be doing a reading in cove uh, with all of you commemorating um titanic and all things maritime has actually been one of my dreams to bring the program to cove to do this since um since the early days of cultivating voices live poetry so I thank you all for joining us here from Cove, um, Ireland tonight. We just have such beautiful featured readers tonight um, and I won't spend much more time because I wanna get to the readings so that we can then also make sure we get as many of you on the open mic as possible. Tonight, um, joining us from Cove, uh, a resident of Cove, mm -hmm. an amazing poet that I met um, we have Judith, Judith, uh, Judith Coffey. We have Catherine Ronan is with <laughs> us. We have Karen J. McDonald is with us. We have John W. Sexton. And I'll be your final featured reader with some Titanic poems um, from Boats for Women and one from the Glass Studio. And then, of course, all of you on the open mic. Well, if you are just joining us for the very first time for Cultivating Voices Live Poetry, here in our Zoom studio, or you might be watching on Zoom or on YouTube. You are very welcome tonight uh, for this special Titanic commemoration. And I'd like to just remind folks, we began the program in March of 2020 as a result of um, COVID shutting down all the readings for, mm. for the poets. Um, and we were broadcasting, in fact, in April of 2020, we we did a commemorative reading with the Titanic featured with the Limerick Writers Center. And you can go back and see um, that incredible recording in our archives as well. So we are an international, intersectional, intergenerational group. We now are over 4,700 members worldwide. So we thank each and every one of you for being with us here, whether you're watching, listening, um, posting. And of course, tonight we're here um, live from Cove. I'm going to go now to introduce our very first guest. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Coffey is a Cove resident, poet, um, of the people, of the people. I, you are a poet of the people. I first met Judith 
at the Bella Vista, mm -hmm. which is a historic hotel here in Cove, where in fact, um, the photographs that we have of Titanic were taken by Father Brown, who disembarked in Queenstown, right here, it was then called Queenstown. And as a result of that, we have the iconic photographs that we have, including the one that is the background, the backdrop for um, the backdrop for, for our screen this evening. And I'll tell you a little bit about that if we have some time. I met Judith at the Bella Vista, which is where Father Brown, the photographer, stayed when he arrived in Cove and got off of Titanic. Mm -hmm. So we were there for a poetry event. We didn't know each other, mm -hmm. but we met that one night as things go and we've stayed in contact. And so when I knew we were coming here to do the reading here in Cove, I thought there's no better person <laughs> than to bring a poet from Cove to the program, um, a person who lives with the history here every day. So would you please welcome Judith Copley. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here tonight. Um, yes, I live just up the hill, actually, in Harbour View. And because I live here, I'm used to being surrounded for the last 20 years by this incredible maritime history. And I'm so happy and proud to live here. I lived in Australia when I was a child for 10 years and in Sydney. And my parents used to take us to Botany Bay a lot, which is where a lot of the Irish convicts would have ended up having left from Queenstown or Cove right down here and gone on those ships in the same route where the Titanic as we know went to America or didn't quite unfortunately but they used to go down to Australia with the convicts and I end up coming back here because I was 12 with my parents I couldn't say I'm staying and um, we ended up somehow not in Dublin but in Cork in the harbour in Crosshaven so I've always been a harbour girl and then um, I went to London for 11 years and then I came back 20 years ago and bought a house in Cove and I feel I've done full circle. So I was living where the convicts went to, and now I'm living where the convicts started. I'm not a convict, so I just want to clarify that now. But anyway, because I live here, my poems are kind of observational witticisms, and I'm going to start with what we locals have to go through. So you all love this town for its tourism, but this one is called The Tourist Trap. Twas yo 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 did you turn on your sound? I've just become a bit. Hold on one second. Hold on. Hold on. You're so magnificent that that's what happened. You're just whoo. My yo ho ho. So, Kenji, we're muted. I'm afraid that your sound went out. Oh, did I hit so anything? You have, maybe. You should have no sound on you. This should Ask be. Ask one mute. You should be muted. Yeah. Your sound's going through here. Okay. okay. Try it again. Okay. Not from the start, though, I say, just from the poem. Just from the poem. Just from the poem. Oh, thank goodness it wasn't from the start. Okay, I'm going to do a much lower yo-ho-ho -ho now. So, the tourist trap. Twas yo-ho-ho -ho and pochin or rum, once the greeting from Cork City's harbour. Now it's cocktail hour and gin and tonics, smoothies, lattes, and the price they incur. Served by students, hipsters and baristas, bearded, pierced and with colourful tattoos, vying to be different in their sameness, were sipping our drinks in pirate zoos. Regeneration can be exciting, new developments within Cork City, but mariners' buildings that meant so much torn down for expansion, such a pity. Now, I live in Cove, it's a heritage town within Cork Harbour on the Great Island. Bright painted terraces on hilly streets, the island's architecture so well planned. But it's more than hay fever that sets me off when the sun shines and the season starts. As Cove's population more than doubles, my tranquil life becomes torn apart. Between car ferries to both France and Spain and those huge cruise ships, it is exciting. But my viewing soon turns to nonchalance, waiting for the end of cruiser sightings. When those ships sail by, it's like an eclipse as darkness descends upon my bedroom. In my PJs, I stand at my window, hoping flashing cameras 
aren't on full Zoom. As locals, we're quite friendly and chatty, so proud of our seafaring history. Until tourists stop us on street corners, seeking guidance, stories and mysteries. When rushing out to work on most mornings, my car keys dangling from my fingers, I hear accents of every description, questioning me and wanting to linger. I feel so obliged to share my knowledge, pointing them to museums and statues. Because Cork is known for its friendliness, smiling patiently back is my virtue. My car gets stuck behind touring coaches, so I feel fraught with these traffic delays. I'm totally caught in a tourist trap whilst they're enjoying their leisurely day. After a hard day's work, I return home, then take a walk along the seashore, but I unexpectedly play hopscotch whilst engulfed by another walking tour. Can't go for a drink as the pubs are jammed. Coffee shops and cafes have no tables. Orderly queues form outside the chippers, anywhere with a maritime label. I find myself dreaming of winter time, winds howling loudly, the waves crashing high. No tourists, no queues. Uh, but being cold and wet? Reality check, sun's high in the sky. Titanic's last call, so many were lost. Lusitania victims resting place. Queen Victoria's first steps on Irish soil, Spike Island and Halbolan naval base. The world's second biggest natural harbour were just beaten by Australia's Sydney. Rowing or splashing and yacht sailing by, I love my safe harbour and River Lee. Thank you. Perfect. So that covers being a tourist in a town like this. Now, my usual style is my nickname is Rude Judes because, as I said, I do kind of observational witticisms on life and my motto being us old girls still want to have fun. So I'm turning it down tonight and being a good girl because, well, the theme that it is tonight. But I'm just going to talk from the perspective of being the local lady. And my next poem is totally, totally different and off track because this one's going to be called Date Gestation. And I'm talking about when we're getting ready for a date. And I'm telling you, it can be a long one. So Date Gestation, part one. A woman's preparation. To start with the shower or soak in the bathtub with wax strips or razor and a rough body scrub. When all has been plucked and my body is smooth, I smear it in sweet smelling creams and perfumes. And that's when I notice my nails and think, why did I use blue polish? Now the recoat must dry. <laughs> the makeup begins with a face pack or scrub. My face is now radiant and ready to dub with eye cream and face cream foundation. And then the blusher, eyeliner, mascara on trend and lips to be lined before using red gloss. But this can't be done until teeth have been flossed. <laughs> you may think my face is now made up a treat. Not quite as I dab it and then I repeat. So now I relook at the outfit I chose. There's plenty to wear but I have no new clothes. Mix and match is the phrase I constantly use when trying to make the dress work with the shoes and clutch bag or handbag or hang from the shoulder. As the shoes are quite plain, the bag can be bolder. And a scarf or a necklace and bangles and rings, important additions, but not too much bling. Though my underwear may be hidden from view, coordinated colors is essential too. <laughs> ah, feck at the legs, I've got two to cover false tan that may run, or tights that may ladder. So now that I know what I'm going to wear, here comes the panic, what to do with my hair? Do I put on the lotions and rollers to set, or pull it back tight with a bow or hair net? Maybe a back home like an electric shock, or 100 brushes for soft, shiny locks. But what if it rains or I'm wearing a hat? My hair will go squiffy and totally flat. Mm. Sky's getting dark. So I will bring my brolly. If that rain hits my hair, I'll go off my trolley. Well, I've checked the rear view. For VPL on my butt, no bra marks, no bulging. I'm ready to strut. Mm -hmm. The gestation time for this great transformation 
took longer than God planning human creation. <laughs> ah, but that was just a woman getting ready. <laughs> Date gestation, part two, <laughs> a man's preparation. Had a shave and shower, put on my jeans and shirt, got the aftershave out, just a little squirt. Does anyone care if my shoes and socks match? Then I comb my hair and think, girls, I'm some catch. The end. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I hope you suffer getting ready for a date in the rest of the world like we do here in Cork. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so, well, probably do. So uh, there's a very special lady sitting next to me now. And if you can't see the obvious, it's Sandy. And if you don't know, it's her birthday coming up kind of next week. And she's facing a big one. <clears throat> Am I allowed to say which one? Yep. She's going to be 60. So she's joining the sexy 60s. Okay. So I wrote this poem years ago when I was about to become 40 and I didn't have the nerve to read it. So then I took the coward's way out and for my 50th birthday, <laughs> I put this poem in my invitation card. But as they say that life begins at 40 and then 50 is the new 40 and at 60 is the new 50, which is actually the new 40, I'm going to give it a go, if we're that all good. makes sense. We're good. So anyway, we're going to call this Tell Me Life Begins at 60, dedicated to our birthday girl, Sandy. Well, she's too fun for pinstripes, too straight for tattoos. <laughs> too young for wash days, too old for the booze. Too blonde for politics, too dark for real sin. <laughs> too red for clubbing, too giggly to sit in. Too traveled for locals, too set for backpackers. Too bored by managers, too fast for the slackers, too cool for a husband, too <laughs> old, well, yeah, too old for sugar dads, <clears throat> too zany for school gates, too wise for the lads, too comfy for stilettos, too sprung for welly boots, too cheeky for G strings, too bright for knitted suits, <laughs> too hip for show bands, too slow to take to rave, but cute enough to figure out. This 60 things okay. Thank you so much for listening to me. <laughs> Hope to see you all soon. Happy birthday, darling. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. That is Judith Coffee, everybody, on her Cultivating Voices live debut. Starting us off again, what I love is genuine you know, resonant of where we are here in Cove, um, you know, doing her poetry everywhere around um, County Cork. So I look forward to Judith being back on the program soon. Right. Well, our next guest featured reader, no stranger to the program and again you know i'm thinking of these like concentric circles um how could we not have another person from county cork join us and who better from county cork to join us than catherine ronan who joins us karen not catherine Oh, Karen. I'm so sorry. <laughs> well, because we're going alphabetical. <laughs> Karen, my apologies. I am so taken by the scenery, by Titanic, that I do not even know the alphabet now. By your birthday. By my birthday. <laughs> by all, you know, by all of it. By I, being I, Ireland. My oh my gosh. I just wrote down. I was like, oh yeah, the alphabet. Right. Okay. Karen J. McDonald is Donald is with us tonight. Hello. And we've been having like like this wonderful like Titanic team tag over um you know over over um over you know over messenger. And, you know, when, when someone is enthusiastic, as enthusiastic about Titanic and want to share things Titanic, 
I never say no. I never say no. And the thing about it, the thing about it is I, oh, obviously folks, we're not doing our regular bios tonight. You can look at the formal bios in the chat. I am very sorry to say to Judith, I of course am one of those tourists that you're talking I know, about. I forgive you. Yeah, I'm the person yeah, that you. walks down the street, asks all the annoying questions, and wants to know everything. So I apologize <laughs> um, that, and and you'll get you'll get you'll get the city back in just just less than thirty six hours. We'll be out of here, much to my chagrin. Now back to Karen. Karen and I were talking and she said, you know, I've got this piece on Titanic. I'm like, yeah, you have to come on the program. Like, of course, like we want to hear it. It's important. Come on. So without further ado, I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to present Karen J. McDonald with her astounding piece of Titanic flash fiction on our special Titanic commemoration this evening. Thank you so, so much for reaching out and encouraging the dialogue between us. Thank you so much, Sandy. Um, hi, everybody. And I know I know you gave me 10 minutes. So I went, oh, bloody hell. So um, need to if, if after you. this, um, can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? And yeah. Or... Yep, you're good. We're good. Okay. Um, so if uh, if there's time after this, I'm going to read a poem about a, a small disaster, depending on the time allowance that you gave me. Okay, so um, I'm just going to literally launch. Uh, straight into this, and I'll just say a couple of words about it afterwards, not too much. It's called Down, and I must thank um, Marie Le Crivan, who published it first in Los Angeles in Poetic Diversity, um, on the 100th anniversary, actually, I think, of this thing. Down. And if, if you can't hear me, or if there's a problem with sound, just holler, I don't mind. Uh, by the way, if you hear a meow, it's the toddler, and it's easier to have her in the room. Moats are drowning in a sunbeam. Eliza turns her head away from the light. On the door of the wardrobe, the sea green taffeta hangs from a satin covered hanger. Her eyes close. Below her, the house moves at its own pace. Catherine is in the study, raking still warm embers from the grate. She will rebuild funnels of paper and kindling under a tumulus of coal. At the back of the house, Laddie barks. Feet on the rug. She launches herself into the day. She drags open the curtains and blinks at the morning. Her head rests against the sash window. Its brass latch ploughs the parting in her hair. A bicycle turns into the drive. And she watches the boy cycle, standing on the pedals, slow against the prevailing wind. He brakes, kicks the stand under the bicycle. He looks up, blushes and adjusts his cap. She pulls back. Catherine is in the hall. Catherine, quickly, door. The door closes. Silence. She stares out. He is sailing, freewheeling down the drive. The wind is at his back, wreckage in his wake. Downstairs, there is movement. There is murmuring, his voice. Then he is moving ponderously, nearer. Even so, the knock at the door makes her jump. From cousin James, sit down, my dear. He's holding the slip of butter yellow paper away from his body. His hand shakes. I should like to read it to the servants. Of course, Thomas. I must dress. Please ask Martha to come up. 
Ruddy normality has washed from Martha's face. She sniffles as she pulls tightly on the corset ties. I will be down presently, Martha. Each stare sends a shockwave through her. She goes down and crosses the hall. Laddie appears from nowhere and snuffles at her skirts. She will not look at him. In the study, Thomas reads the telegram to the servants. The women cry. Eliza holds out her hand. She takes the telegram. I must tell the bees. Laddie zigzags from the house and skelters down the lawn. Catherine watches Eliza and the dog move through the long grass towards the beehives. The top of Laddie's tail bobs beside his mistress. Catherine halts at the garden's verge. She scuffs her shoes in the gravel. Wait. Eliza says, There is news of our golden boy. She reads to them. Interviewed Titanic's officers, all unanimous, Andrews heroic unto death, thinking only safety of others. The bees hymn in her ears. Expansion comes tearing, like the cracking of a corset steel bones. Grief rushes in. She goes down, bellowing, billowing, black watered silk. Excuse the cat, my sincere apology. Um, and that that story um, was prompted by reading that Thomas Andrews, as a child, he had a lot of interest, and as a young man, um, that he kept bees. And I thought the, the beehives, he, he lived in Belfast, so the beehives were probably in the family home. Um, so that's where the, the idea came from. And then that telegram is the precise wording of the telegram that, that was actually sent to the family from a, rel a relation in on the other side of the Atlantic. So that's where the story came from. Um, and... Uh, if there's time, I will read that poem about the other little maritime disaster. There is. OK. Um, and you, I've read your beautiful poem about Southampton, Sandy, and about the taking on of supplies and everything. And I know that in a lot of discussions about the sinking, that the impact that the sinking had on, on the actual city and the town, especially the, the internal coastal community in Southampton was ferocious. And um, this is a poem about something that happened 55 years ago, just up the road from here, um, close to the Flaggy Shore. I know a lot of even non-Irish people know about the Flaggy Shore because of Seamus Heaney's poem, um, in a tiny little place called New Quay. And uh, basically an oyster uh, boat, a new oyster boat arrived in the harbour, this tiny little pier. But the place where it is, is this narrow strip of water and the current there is ferocious. And when the boat arrived, there was great joy in the community and he offered the children a ride on the boat. And a lot of people piled into the boat and some he actually sent some of them off, but didn't realize that some kids jumped on again when he went into the wheelhouse. Um, so, it capsized. Uh, so this is a poem. New key. And I'm actually going to, if I can. There we go. There's a link to something about the actual disaster. Uh, in 1969, nine children died in the Red Bank disaster. New key, County Clare. Six strange beasts rose up still breathing in the water where you drowned. They seemed to be walking, heads held proud of the sea. Then a flash of neon green dispelled impressions as flippers breached harrowing the surface. Reddened faces, then hands, 
and wet suited torsos sucking up out of the shallows. Squelching, chatty men, speaking of currents strong enough to pull boys under. We never had a chance when adventure turned to disaster, capsizing every summer. And that's it. Um, and I've just realized uh, boys, of course, are pronounced is a buoy in America. Yeah. There you go. What a what a beautiful, beautiful set. This is clear. If you've just joined us, this is Cultivating Voices Live Poetry joining you live from Hove, Ireland. You've just been listening to Karen J. McDonald. And um, folks, we're not doing sharing the usual professional bios, but please do read the bios. I mean, uh, Karen has is working on a second collection, has um, a very robust publishing um, publishing and with her first collection and just so thrilled that you were able to join us and really add something incredibly beautiful to the program tonight. Thank you so very much. Well, Again, my apologies for not being able to know the alphabet this evening. And now I believe the alphabet is back intact and um, and I'm able to introduce uh, Catherine Ronan. Before I do, however, I want to I want to piggyback on something that Karen had shared with all of us. There is a very famous photograph also um, that has a caption uh, from um, from Southampton, which is where I got the one of the ideas for the poem that I wrote. I'm not going to read that poem tonight. So, um, but if you're interested, there's a there's a there's a photograph of the row houses on one of the roads in Southampton. There were over 500 crew members from Southampton on that ship, on Titanic. And the caption of this particular photograph is basically that like, you know, everybody on the street lost a member, like lost actually the breadwinner in the family. So in one night, co um, Queen, uh, Queens, Southampton, um, was thrown into immense, immense um, poverty, basically because the women now had lost uh, lost their income. Um, and to imagine, you know, to imagine a city losing that many um, that many people in one night, an incredible, incredible, one of the incredible and incredibly sad parts of Titanic's story. There's there's so many, but you can see that photograph with that caption marking all the houses on that road that had lost a member of their family on that evening from Southampton. There are, you know, what I particularly appreciate about Titanic so much is that it is one of the most, one of my favorite words is prismatic and Titanic is one of, the most prismatic stories that I think we have in history. There are so many angles and ways to look at it. There's a human aspect. There's the building of the ship. There's all the different ports of call. Um, and uh, of course, then there's the, uh, the finding of the ship. There's the bringing the artifacts up. There's just so many facets through history and, um, it seems to be a story that just keeps on giving us stories. Uh, some of them are ecstatic stories. Um, and depending on your cultural background, um, the country that you're from, um, you know, may have a very different perspective than another country. So for instance, in the States, we I grew up hearing so much about the first class passengers and all the the grandness of the ship 
But here in Ireland, the narrative, the strongest narrative of many narratives was the immigration experience. And millions and millions of people passed through this port of Queenstown, now Cove. If you're ever able to come to Cove, you can go to the Cove Heritage Center and you can learn and uh, learn about Titanic, Lusitania, but also the very significant, um, the very significant stories of how the Irish lived in Ireland and immigrated particularly to America. So without further ado, let me invite my next guest who is no stranger to the program. You pretty much come every single week, which I love. Um, but you you are from the very county where Cove is. It's just a short train ride from Cork down here. We were just in Cork with you at Ovale. I, of course, am talking about the illustrious, the very starry night, knighted Catherine Ronan. Welcome. There you are. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I have to say now, having uh, uh, Sandy and Kim here in the flesh is like me being on holidays in Cork, which is something <laughs> new, I have to say, for me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read two poems tonight, not from my book. Um, and Sandy has no idea what I'm going to read. But because it's her birthday shortly, I've made an extra special effort and researched the these poems. So the first poem I want to, to, to uh, recite is a poem I composed in memory of Wallace Hartley and his fiancée, Maria Robinson. And Wallace Hartley was the bandmaster who was reportedly and um, played Near My God to Thee as the, as the ship sank. Uh, they were due to get married in the June, and of course they didn't, but his violin was recovered and given to Maria Robinson, who in turn gave to her sister, who in turn gave to a music student, and it was found in an attic and auctioned for over one million euro and now on public display for all to see. So I call this poem Every June. In memory of Wallace Hartley and Maria Robinson. Clutching the symbol of your love, I play nearer. Stars catch the last strains and follow you on earth. I exhale fearless into the cold arms of fate. My body returns wrapped in cork and linen. My spirit varnishes the wood, polishes your words. Eternity sparkles in glass cabinet size of the world. Two cracks, two strings, a testimony to love that crosses all time. Mm -hmm. Even if the sun, moon, and stars forget, we pull down the sky to marry every June. Oh, oh my God. Oh, 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 that Titanic departed from. Now I consulted with a very good buddy of mine who lives on the Bear Peninsula, Niall O'Sullivan. Now I must clarify, he's Niall John L. O'Sullivan because there are seven other Niall O'Sullivans on the Bear Peninsula because I, my maiden name is O'Sullivan, but O'Sullivan Bear. So there's a lot of O'Sullivans on the Bear. So this is this information came from John Niall John L. O'Sullivan. He said that when the Titanic was sailing that the last thing that the people of the Titanic saw 
where bonfires lit on Dursey Island to say farewell to the passengers. And that was the very last thing that they saw as they left Ireland. So I call this Dursey's farewell to Titanic. Souls of the land sing you out to sea. A clear night shines with orange eyes. Flames blistering at your departure lick the dawn. Tin whistled feet dance on cliffs, thrumming with rhythm and weight of wistful night. Billowing specks fly heaven bound to ink the stave of shifting sky. Children jump over white haired embers. Gorse voices of ancestors throat to steerage, lullabying the hull as the seabed stirs with uneasy dream and watering anticipation of tomorrow. Mm. A tomorrow of love burning beyond now. A titanic of love burning beyond time. Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. 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 You know, she said, oh, I have something different for you tonight than I usually share. Mm. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Folks, if you've never written a poem inspired by the Titanic, look, look at what Catherine just did. Like, you know, and she went and did a little bit, well, maybe not a little bit of research, a, a, a mammoth Titanic amount of research. I, I know it well, but, um, you know, to create something uniquely Catherine Ronan and provocative and transcendent, you know, beyond, beyond belief. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And yep. And I wanted to also remind folks, please, please, please feel free to share the love in the chat, share the love in the chat. And uh, I am so very pleased to introduce our next featured reader. We had the unbelievable honor, joy, gift, you know, of, of a lifetime to be able to travel yesterday, to be in the presence and read with John W. Sexton and Eileen Sheehan in Ken Mayer at the Carnegie Arts Center. Um, we were so welcomed, felt so loved. And the only thing better than being able to read with John yesterday is that we get to hear him again tonight. So please welcome one of my Salmon siblings, John W. Sext. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Can I be heard? Oh, sound absolutely perfect. Good. <laughs> I had trouble getting in, but here I am now. Um, I was working on a Titanic poem, and I am still working on the Titanic poem, and I hope to have it finished tomorrow. But I want to read a Titanic poem by another poet. It's actually, I'm just going to read a small section of it. It's um, a, an epic poem called RMS Titanic and uh, was first published in 1961. It's by the late Irish poet Anthony Cronin. I had the great pleasure of reading with Anthony Cronin some years ago. He had just had his cataract operation and was able to read uh, with ordinary glasses 
for the first time in his life. Up until then, he had what was called those bottle bottom glasses. Um, anyway, um, as I say, this uh, this was a, a is a long poem. It's an epic poem. Anthony Cronin is the lad for doing the epic poems. Uh, in 1989, he, he wrote another epic poem called The End of the Modern World, and it contained 179 sonnets. So he was the lad for the long poem. So anyway, here's just um, uh, two sh verses from R.S. Titanic from uh, the late Anthony Cronin and may heaven increase him. Down underneath the Irish poor are singing their songs of Philadelphia in the morning, in comradeship romantically clinging to those whom they would murder without warning. A warm freeze crowd where every eye is crying and all the songs are always of misfortune, inured to the snug, cosy slop of dying. They watch the grey rats creeping to the ocean. Down here, no one will judge and all's forgiven. Every man loves the thing he kills and slowly, with many a tear, the smiler does the knifing. Down here, the failure to redeem is holy. Their songs of loss, of exile, desolation, hang on the wide still night. They shout of loving. Each heart is full of black midnight emotion and will create a sorrow for its proving. Surely among the rich men's snowy linen, the dignified and decent can be found, the stainless crystal cut glass attitudes and mouths shut on the boy's need to impress. Instead of the hysterical moist palm, the smiling urgencies of need and love. The traders charm, the clever ones reply. Familiarities of skin and cloth clinging in fecundation to the sweat. What won't wash out the bit of shit on shirt, the fungoid socks, the broken shoe, skinned heel, the hanging round for hours, the aptly named, indeed intrusive, hand on shoulder touch. Surely the rich who know the tiny shiver caressing the dry, lonely, selfish skin contrive to keep some attitudes intact. Reptiles who change three times a day their cloth. <clears throat> well, that was a miserable poem on the RMS Titanic. And it's really, I think, captures uh, the reality of, of the Titanic. I'm working on a poem, as I say, and I will have it finished tomorrow. And I'm going to send it off somewhere for consideration. I hope you're noting that, Sandy. Um, I had great uh, misgivings, actually, about writing a Titanic poem. I think all of us do when we approach something like that, because you're approaching um, the loss of others, the pain of others, something that's gone long before us. Anyway, I'm just going to read two more poems now. <clears throat> and as I don't have any Titanic poems, I've decided to read a poem of entering water. In many cultures in the world, and certainly in our own here in Ireland, um, we would often enter water as an oracle and water would give us answers from the supernatural depths. And here is a poem about entering water in search of something, in search of an answer of some kind. This is called The Woodland Beneath the Lake. The tip of the oar 
makes a spiral that will draw you down if you lean fingers first. Take a deep breath as you enter, for the lake is all there is to breathe. Though entering fingers first, you'll land on the soles of your feet. Not a single fish will you see. Sodden birds will flap past heavily, but without a sound, for there's no sound down here. Beneath your feet, you'll see a weak, distant sun, or perhaps a moon, but it'll always be trembling. Light will rise straight up, but will be swallowed in the dark, silty sky. Head deep into the heart of the nearby wood, and do not aim to stop. You'll stop only when you are stopped by another. Hopefully, the only one you will come upon will be an old woman sitting aside a stag, a stag covered in scales like verdigris. She will be holding a basket of buttons. Take whichever button she offers you and return at once. That button is the mind your mother lost this winter past. Only you can retrieve it. Only you can return it. Do not wonder if it appears unremarkable. Um, I'm a vision poet and uh, I practice um, an ancient uh, form of meditation called in Bosphorosne. Um, I enter deeply into inspiration. I'm a muse pagan and a muse poet, and I worship um, the goddess of complete being. And everything I try to write um, is really part of um, the journey into poetry into the depths of poetry. But sometimes poetry isn't anywhere particularly deep. It's right in front of us. And mostly poetry comes from the people who are in front of us. Now I'm recording uh, these poems here tonight um, from Carx up on Corran Moor. Corran Moor, the great cairn, is the mountain on which I live. And Carx is the townland here. Carx means place of the grouse. And a hundred yards from this house, uh, there is uh, another house. When I first came back home to Ireland 42 years ago, um, that house was a ruin and it was um, known and is still known to us, even though she no longer lives there, and even though it's been refurbished and someone else lives there now, um, it was known as Minnie Shea's house. Minnie Shea was the woman who lived in that house. But when I came here, she had since long gone, 20 years before, into Kenmare Town. And I used to visit her. And one day she told me a story of herself in that house. Somehow uh, the house and the old woman became one. The house at that time was falling to pieces and looked like it had one eye because it had one sound window. And of course, when I first met Minnie Shea, she had just had a cataract operation and her glasses were blacked out in one eye. She had one eye. This poem, and I read it now here in Carx, to resurrect the dead, to resurrect Minnie Shea, as an honor to Minnie Shea, the woman of this poem, and to remember her through the story, the true story she told me. The old woman and the house of one eye. <clears throat> When the old woman died, the house began to die. 
It slumped in its delirium of mold, only one good eye looking out. In its dimming vision, all it could see was the past. And she was younger then, and so was the house, and the sky was catching its hem on the mountains, and the sea was a shattering mirror. And that was the morning that the kestrel carried a hen from the yard, grasping the hen by a single wing. And the hen was a panic of feathers flapping its one free wing. And then it was that she took flight herself, out from the kitchen, her apron strings loose, the apron turning and caught at her throat. And flowing behind her was that apron, a single wing. And a zigzag of flight took the kestrel and the hen low over the meadow, knee height and then grass height, and then knee height and then grass height. But she caught up with them, and stooping down knee height, she caught the hen by its tail. But the kestrel held firm, and downhill it dragged her, her with the hen by the tail. And her apron flapped wildly behind her, a single wing. And the loop of the lace on her black shoe snagged a furry stump. And down she went, down, pulling the hen and the kestrel. And the kestrel loosened its talons and took to the sky. And she and the hen tumbled in the meadow, a moment of feathers and a clatter of clucking. And the sky was leaving its threads on the mountains. And the sea was a shattering mirror. This is all the house recalls now, its single eye dim of vision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy and everyone for having me this evening. Uh, I kept my piece short, uh, really my own poems, because uh, there's a lot of readers and now I'd like to listen to them. So good evening, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. And great to see you again, Sandy, and hope I'll meet you again in the flesh very soon. I wish for the same, of course, and I'm very hopeful that it will happen in the next two weeks. That's John W. Sexton with an absolutely transcendent set. Thank you so, so very much um, for invoking all that you invoked uh, with all those ripples through time immemorial. Well, we're pretty much having this commemoration tonight because I'm the host and I'm obsessed with Titanic. So on April 14th, that's, that's what I wanna do is be with anything related to Titanic and of course to, and what better way than to celebrate with poetry. Um, I am gonna read, I think three poems so that we can get to the open mic. Um, and I want to just say that the poems, even though I wrote them for Boats for Women, and it was pretty much an anchor for my first collection. They still keep they still keep arriving. Um, I wrote one when I was at Ovale in Cork just a couple weeks ago on the five week challenge. Uh, on the five week challenge. challenge, and something just happened. I'm hearing some feedback. Okay, we're good now. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to read a poem from two poems from Boats for Women and the poem, a poem in the glass studio. And I just want to say for me, it's always an incredibly, um, somber day usually 
on April 14th because I really feel the weight of um, the loss. And having been to the Titanic site and having had a rather transcendent experience when I was um, there for the 100th anniversary, uh, I really do feel incredibly connected to all to the all souls that were lost. Um, and so to be in Cove and to be with the celebration of all the fanfare that was around when she, when she was her final port of call, um, only to have the news be so very devastating to so many communities around Ireland and England and frankly, around the world. I went to the Titanic Memorial Service here in Cove today, and there was a member of the Lebanese Titanic Society um, talking about the family um, that had been lost on Titanic when they boarded here in Queenstown. So there's so much that's moving. And I also met a, I also met a woman whose great uncle died on the Titanic today. I met her today at the memorial. Um, and his name was Jeremiah Burke. And you can look up his story. He boarded here in Cove. Um, her mother had just passed away and was the last of that generation. And she felt it was important to come to Cove today to um, make sure that the family would always continue to remember uh, her family member, Jeremiah Burke. So there's an incredible weightiness to um, being in Cove. Um, and there's an, in, there's an, and there's an incredible, um, there's an amazement around the story of Titanic all the time. But um, I'm just mindful of the, you know, of, as it gets darker, I always get a little more somber. Um, but let me, people always ask me, what's your interest in Titanic? And I don't, I can't tell you, I don't know the depth of why, but I can tell you one thing that has been an interesting thread throughout my life. It also happens to be, April 14th also happens to be my parents' wedding anniversary. So they were married on April 14th, 1963. And of course, um, as you, as many of you in the room know, my dad passed away two years ago. My mom is here with us in the, in the, in the Zoom room tonight. And um, so it would have been their 61st anniversary today. So I just want to send out a little love to my mom. I'll see you in a few weeks. I'm really glad you made it onto Zoom tonight. And I'm going to read a poem that is about that connection between Titanic and my parents' wedding anniversary. It's called Providence, April 14th, 1998. When I call my parents to wish their marriage continued success, hear the Connecticut shore breaking in the background, I am thinking also of the ship, hoping that maybe on this April 14th, the Titanic doesn't hit the iceberg, that Captain Smith for once heeds the warnings of ice and doesn't give in to speed, that the lookouts have binoculars, that the Californian doesn't put its radio to sleep 10 minutes before the first distress call. But my mother isn't thinking about her anniversary or the iceberg when I call. She is thinking about Providence when she says she has something she wants to ask me. Thinking about Providence, Rhode Island, before and after I hang up, the Providence of last summer's love now ringing in my ears, and all that week before spent convincing my mother that she was just a friend. But I was nervous at dinner, 
couldn't eat. On the drive to Providence, I grew tired and had to stop at the scenic overlook in Mystic, where in the dark, I could just make out the shadows of the historic ships pressed against the night. In Providence, her plane was the last to land and late, pulling into its gate like the Carpathia arrived in New York, alone and anticipated. I sat in the airport with my head in my hands, afraid of whomever might not deplane. But when I looked up, she stood before me with her luggage in hand, and in the middle of the terminal, we held each other as survivors of what we did not yet know. Well, as I mentioned, you know, um, the Titanic doesn't run its course with me. Um, and so there happens to be, in my new book, there happens to be two poems in the glass studio that are about Titanic. And I'm going to read um, a sonnet. The Final Crossing of Captain Edward J. Smith. And um, I should just say this, that um, Edward J. Smith was, um, he was basically the commandeer of the entire White Star Line fleet. Um, so to be named the captain of the Titanic was the most um, honored you could be to. And it was, so he, he was on, he was the captain of the maiden voyage for the Titanic. He was at the pinnacle of his career and he was going to retire after the maiden voyage. Imagine that. He did retire. This is the final crossing of Captain Edward J. Smith. His voice had never fallen hoarse his whole career until on board tonight. He regrets for a waterlogged moment, the crystal stems, the five course meal, the toasting of names the headlines will never forget. His first class guests, now merely occupants of the same fate as all the others. A monsoon of panic overtakes the glassy calm. Chants of women and children first swoon through the Atlantic chill. How to captain when riven with everything unsinkable sinking between not enough time and too few lifeboats? He cuts the ribbon between himself and April 14th. Now, two plus hours into April 15th, death hovers an instant away. He resigns to a final breath. Father Brown, um, who was the very famous photographer um, who disembarked here in Queenstown and stayed at the Bella Vista up the hill from here, um, has a, there's a famous photograph. It's one of the last of, it's probably the last photo taken of Edward J. Smith. You can look at that. He's leaning over um, and looking, staring right into one of the lifeboats. I mean, it's kind of a haunting image when you think that those lifeboats would um, would not in fact do what they were prepared to do or put on the ship to do because there were too few of them. So for him to stare into the very thing that would be um, the demise of so many, meaning not enough of those ships. Well, I'm gonna end with um, the title poem from Boats to Women. Um, I know folks have heard it many times, um, but it just seems appropriate. And um, so this is Boats for Women. Thanks for listening. And I'm really looking forward to the open mic. Boats for Women. Yes, the boat sank. Yes, it broke in two like a stereotypical heart until 70 years later, technology caught up and looked its ancestor in the face. Yes is the way the years oxidize the steel and yes wipes the name Titanic off the bow. Yes are the lifeboats, the davits, the call for women and children first. 
Yes, are the men who cry from the decks. Sometimes when I kiss her, I am leaving a yes on her lips to let her know I will go down with this ship. Sometimes when she whispers yes, we are staying on board. But there is always room in the lifeboats for two more women. Yes is the fact that if we were alive on that night, we would have lived. Thank you very much, everybody. Well, we move to hear your moving poems um, in all the in all the ways that they may move us. And I would like first to uh, remind you all that if you, you know, we're in some hallowed ground this evening, some hallowed waters this evening. Um, there, uh, so, but if you do feel that you need to give um, a content notice for anything out of the realm of what we might need to, we realize that we're likely talking about some maritime death and such. But if you need to give a content notice for anything else, please do. Um, our open micers will be reading one poem up to three minutes. And I would like to first um, welcome uh, our first reader tonight is Glenda Chimino. Thank you so much, Glenda, for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. I'm just reading one short poem tonight. It's a poem I wrote some time ago, but it is relevant, I think, to the to the terrible and emotional question still of the Titanic, the hubris of man. It's it's the Tower of Babel. It's it's all of our pride and hubris, you know, going to show that we're not what we think we are. Anyway, this is called Roulette. Can you hear me okay? Okay. In every great catastrophe, there is always the one who just happened to take the bus that morning, argued with his wife, and left a little later than usual, made it to the airport just in time to catch the fatal plane, got to the port just in time to jump on the fatal ship. These are the people who, not knowing what they choose, choose death. Life itself is Russian roulette. Thank certainly you. Per certainly pertinent and certainly poignant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, welcome. I'm so excited next to welcome, you know, a person that Kim and I adore. And uh, I, I, and we knew that uh, Barbara Quick had Titanic poem. Um, so we are waiting with bated breath here in cold. Welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Sandy. Can you hear me all right? Good. Um, this I wrote this poem especially for this occasion. I wrote it this past week. And forgive me, I think it is a minute too long, but I'll try to read it rather fast. Thank you for having me here. It's called Two Shipwrecks and a Slip of a Girl. It wasn't April when my ship put in at Cove. I had no idea about the shadow cast there in 1912 by the Titanic, nor sensed the shades of the doomed Irish who climbed aboard then, where I'd just disembarked. I was 21, a slip of a girl following fairy lights further and further away from what I'd ever called home. Strange to think, this was 49 years ago. The nearly new ship flew a Soviet flag. For 200 bucks, still possessed of a student ID, I crossed the sea from New York to Ireland, where the offer of a place to stay awaited me, a place to start what I hoped would be my life as a writer. I had a ridiculous boyfriend in tow. An heiress I'd met in New Mexico, someone living out her own doomed romance in a desert hovel, found promise, I guess, in the stories and poems I read to her, and liked the child ballads I sang while I played my guitar. 
with a hug as I left to drive the rest of the way to New York. She said that she had a cottage and tower in West County Cork. I've always wanted to let a young writer live there, she told me, as if spun whole cloth from a fantasy. Send me your address when you have one, and I'll tell you how to get the key from Mr. Houlihan, the grocer and taxi man who can drive you there from Clonakilty. It all sounded fine to me. Strange to think this was 49 years ago. The Mikhail Lermontov, a 20-ton ship, 12 decks high, was too large to make land in the harbor at Cove. With my little suitcase and guitar in tow, my long black hair blew athwart my face as I boarded the tender with a crowd of long absent Irish returning home. The farewells called out by our newfound friends left behind were drowned in the blast of the ship's horn on that starry night. Streamers were launched from the topmost rails as our little boat's first mate cast off the lines. A passenger produced a penny whistle and played a tune as the tillermen steered us toward the glimmer of the town, and I felt a sense of sadness that seemed not my own. It can take us a lifetime to know what we know. Was it my present-day self I sensed then, my black hair turned gray as I hurtled through the final part of my life to an unknown shore? Or was it the shades of those Irish who drowned that day in 1912, looking to hitch a ride back to their beloved homeland? <clears throat> or was it the future shipwreck of the Mikhail Lermontov, picked up by a witchy antenna inside of me, which has sometimes seen grave illness or death when no one has known that anything's amiss. A decade would pass before that ship sank to the bottom of the sea. My sense of dread was short-lived, gone by the time we stepped ashore. I set about finding a place for us to spend the night and was helped by the local Garda, who gave me the coin I needed to make a call, saying, as he did so, welcome to Ireland. It can take us a lifetime to know what we know. Strange to think this was 49 years ago. Thank you so much. That's Kim just said from the couch. That's beautiful. That is beautiful. That's Barbara Quick, everyone. I, I, this, what you did tonight is what I, what I find in the power of the tight of the Titanic as narrative or, or as image, um, is that it is, it allows us to fuse the historical with the personal. Um, it it truly truly does, and uh, and what an exquisite example of that! Thank you, thank you for sharing that poem, Barbara. Well, thank you, thank you so much, Sandy and Kim. Um, looking forward now to hearing our good friend uh, Marcella Raymond joining us from South Dakota. Thank you, Sandy. Um, I just have one short poem. This is called Maiden Voyage. Had I been there on that April night, third class, traveling as I must with fiance or father, I like to think I would have wandered off alone, tucked myself at last into a leather chair in the library, reading the goddess of reason. After four days, my stomach would have settled and I would have found comfort in the rocking and solitude below. Those upstairs women in gowns and furs, tipping champagne or swishing up and back on the promenade. I like to think that far enough away from the upper decks, it would still have been quiet below the bump and scrape of that iceberg, 
just rough seas or engine noise to my young mind. And once I knew, would I have scrambled for a lifeboat or would my lifeboat have been the piece below, the leather chair, the book, the cup of tea and the sudden cold water, that blanket of sea? Thank you. Wow, poems tonight. <laughs> I know we're all like, wow. Um, you know, I, also, I think that the poem, that the Titanic, because of the prismatic, the prismatic aspect of the story, it, it does lend itself to so much contemplation, so much contemplation of what ifs, what might be, what could have been, no matter what decade, you know, what time frame, what story. Uh, that's an, that's a terrific, that poem's a terrific example of that. That's Marcella Raymond, everyone. Thank you so much. Good to see you. See you soon. Well, joining us from New York, which has an incredibly rich history with the story of Titanic, many aspects. And if you go to New York City, um, it has many, many memorial plaques and, and touchstones related to Titanic. And of course, New York was to be Titanic's, um, you know, port of call. Uh, so joining us, Patricia Kerrigan. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. This is an old poem written in 2003, rewritten as of, as of today. The Veil. A maiden crossed an aqueous veil, and time stood still when the sea's icy wink outdid the human eye. Debates sparked over error and prevention. Death and futility didn't care if you were rich or poor. The what ifs fueled unlimited fascination. Facts and fiction still write her stories. Her bare bones on the ocean floor, inspiration for a blockbuster film. Her legend torn between profit, honor, and glory. But she would never disclose how she suffered that night, feeling helpless after her violation, meeting the Reaper when she split apart. She couldn't trust humans again. Only the sea understood. Like Rose, her heart would go on. And into the afterlife, Titanic sailed, her secrets safe with the sea. Thank you. You know, I'm glad that you brought that poem back, that you kept working on that, that you brought that poem back. Oh, wow. That's Patricia Kerrigan, everyone. Thank you so much. Well, we stay here in New York with Mary Louise Kiernan. And I want to just say, coming off of a wonderful experience in Cork at Ovale, we saw her on the big screen, and it was a thrill to be in the room, seeing you and Marcella, both of you, um, that night. So welcome, and um, thank you so much. You're very kind, Sandy. Um, so I do have a familial connection to Cove, which is formerly known as Queenstown. My grandfather, John Joseph Kiernan, boarded the SS Cedric and uh, came to New York. And it's through him and uh, my grandmother that I have dual Irish citizenship. And I got three special deliveries from Ireland this week. This was the first one. Sandy and Owen's collection arrived. And then Elemental Skin by Catherine Ronan. And then the actual physical copy of the Five Words uh, publication. And uh, based on those special deliveries, my I think my mailbox was on fire this week, but um, 
So Sandy, you talked about, you know, your connection to Titanic and, and it's kind of a mysterious, there's no explanation. And it's the same with the poem that was published in this amazing collection, which just arrived. And um, I don't know why I connected with a squirrel, but I did. So this is dedicated to squirrels in Ireland, New York, everywhere. And the title has the word tail twice. And the first word tail is spelled T-A-L-E. And the second one is T-A-I-L. A tail for no tail. A squirrel is a squirrel is a squirrel, you tell yourself. Until you spy the one with no tail, catapulting from limb to limb to limb across the old twin trunk tree how could it have no tail? Caught in a snap trap with no way out to chew it off? A tangle with another critter? No matter, there are chores, errands, work to do, yet you wait. This rodent races light. Could there be a pair? Do squirrels have twins? Triplets? Twin sheets getting ripe. Finishing with the washings, you find no tail twining itself around a birch branch seesawing. Its tail hair sought for fly fishing lures. Did someone yank the tail and run? In his shed, your uncle chopped tails of caught plump mice to collect bounty. For years, your no tail springs up, down, around the tree. How long can a squirrel survive? Then you find a new home where your garden grows riper and riper. Pulling at weeds, you ignore two full-tailed gray squirrels. You search the word squirrel. Its roots sprout from scurs, skia for shadow, or for tail, Greek for a squirrel sits in the shadow of its tail. Once again, you recall the squirrel with no tail, only to ponder the why of why you wonder. And no tail now has a tail. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That's Mary Louise Kiernan, everyone. And again, it, you know, I, I I love repetition. So I love I love that I got to hear that poem again tonight. It brings me back to when we were in Cork you know, just last, just last week or whenever it was the, you know, the calendar's a little bit of a blur right now. So thank you. And we'll see you very soon. Well, next we hear from Joanne James. And I was thrilled to see you in the room a little earlier, a little early so we could have a little bit of a chat. Thank you so much for joining us. Can't wait to hear your poem. Sorry, folks. Um, looks like we had quite a, we had a little, uh, Joanne must have been off the, off, off the Zoom, um, kind of, you know, sometimes how folks drop off the radar a little bit can happen. So I'm very happy to now welcome Judith Lowen Thurley. Oh, great rating that we heard from from Judith. So I'm looking forward to this poem, of course, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sandy, I wrote this for you, especially for the occasion and for the theme. <clears throat> and um, it's a renga, it's just six verses, six haiku making a renga. And I, uh, it's, I'm calling it Milvana Dean, if that name means anything to you. Yeah, okay, so this is Milvana Dean. Just before midnight, I was at my mother's breast. The ship lurched, grinding. Over the gunwale, down and down they lowered us. Our boat of the night. Sorry, our boat of the dark. Into the cold dark, down and down they lowered us. 
on my mother's breast. Blanket around us, the cold ocean deathly calm. Down and down we went. Underneath the stars, we rode the icy water, the abyss beneath us. Through the freezing night, the warmth of my mother's breast, keeping me alive. Thank you for this. Thank you. Wow. Um, I was at a birthday party last night at the Commodore Hotel of a person I didn't know. That's Ireland. I, that's not, Judith just said that's Ireland. <laughs> and, and it was like by the by the end of the night, I knew a lot more people. Right. That's Ireland, too. Right. Yeah. And I was talking to a guy who knew, who had spent time with Milvina Dane at the end of her life, had gone over to Southampton a couple times. So Milvina was the youngest on board. She was three months old and she was the last survivor. She died at 99. So she almost made it to the 100th anniversary and she was scheduled to go on the titanic memorial cruise if she had survived she would have been on the cruise that would have brought her back into cove and would have taken her to new york because we did survive it we i did i did it so i know it worked it we it got us there um and what a beautiful poem that was very it was incredibly moving and i've been you clearly knew that uh, that I'd been thinking a lot about her because she was very good friends with the wife of a bar owner here in Cove. She came once here to Cove. She stayed at the Commodore Hotel for three days. and But I guess they didn't prepare a lot of activities for her. So she did her thing the first day. And then there was nothing apparently. And so this woman, her name is Anna Marie. Anna Marie. Do you do you know? Do you know? She was the wife of a man named Danny who owned oh, Connie Doolins. Then he's gone now too. He died between he died three years ago. But those two were very good friends. And she took really good care of Milvina when she was here in Cove. So there's a little bit of history and, and we've been talking about her. So gosh, what a, oh man, thank you. I mean, it really choked me up to, to your poem about her. Wow. All right. Well, we continue on folks. Again, Titanic is so prismatic. There's so, so many stories. Um, as I said, about the ship, about the people, about the night, uh, about the many, many nights before and after, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what Harvey Sauce is going to contribute to tonight's Titanic narrative that we're collectively building. Welcome. Yeah. Am I unmuted? I guess I am. Uh, okay, I don't have, uh, I actually do somewhere, but I don't know where it is, a, a poem on the Titanic. I do have one that, uh, an oceanic uh, theme poem that references Titanic hubris. Um, and let me just explain initially that um, Gowanus is an area in Brooklyn. Um, the, it's bisected by about a two mile long canal called the Gowanus Canal, which is what's called a super fun site and has been for at least the last 10 or 15 or 20 years, which means that it has the distinct uh, honor of being one of the most toxic sites in America. Um, this is called Ahab in Gowanus. And the epigraph is, because a poem is a portal and permits, indeed encourages, time travel. The sickly water should have tipped him off. It certainly wasn't the cobalt swash we're used to when we think of coastal Massachusetts with perhaps some slight discoloration from all that tea in Boston Harbor taken straight or with a splash fed by runoff from Bunker Hill. 
The why and the how of it is for science guys to figure out. Yet there he was, the peg-legged master of the Pequod, dropped smack athwart the Gowanus Canal, a Superfund site perpetually underfunded for cleanup where morbid mobies go to die, composing and decomposing whale songs of farewell, toxic and sludgy enough to turn a white whale black. The captain's purported death beneath the waves, reported by Herman Melville, was only an elaborate ruse fate employed to bring him back to us as a serial character. Exit stage left, enter again, stage right. Here's Ahab, an annotation of time and space not reliant upon the author's pen a blowback perhaps of all that space dust kicked up by the industrial revolution into the semblance of a man familiar to us. The details of how he first appeared on Gowanus's Union Street Bridge, a newly transplanted Brooklynite harpoon dragging behind him in the manner of a kangaroo's tail amid cries of, hey buddy, get your ass and that thing back on the sidewalk would have caused physicists to plot Eureka at their blackboards, awaiting further revelation, stumping book critics, inducing string theorists to play cat's cradle. Restaurant workers taking a cigarette break gawked at his tarred trousers still smelling of whale oil and more than a century in time's closet. Who was this man sporting the ball-bearing eyes of Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry, an Ecce Homo production demanding, well, punk, do you feel lucky? Leaving evangels to think our bad luck it was Ahab and not Jesus, resurrected on the bridge during rush hour. Imperiously, in character, he quelled honking horns by brandishing his harpoon, a dirty harry act that all but shouted, do you want some of me? Well, do you? And not a punk among that crew got out of his car. Taking aim at an uncertain future, heaving his barbs like Nantucket limericks at the white whale of a passing cloud, he shook his fist heavenward to remind God of debts due and owing, a less toxic ending for Ahab and his Moby Dick. Thank you. That's Harvey Sauce, everyone. Thank you so so very much. Well, folks, I want to I want to I want to I want to keep going a little bit. Um, there's there's just six more left. Yeah, yeah. I think we can do it. Uh, I hope. Those of you who can stay for our six last readers. I'd love to hear them. So let's just move along. Let's steam, steam ahead, steam ahead. Um, and next we'll hear from Cathalma Thrine for her, of course, we got to meet in Limerick. Thank you. Hello, Sandy. Hello, everybody. Sharp poem. Can you hear me? Good. The Sinking of the Titanic, 15th of April, 1912. Atlantic dark water shivered across her dipping bow, sinking her down to the darkness below. Her deck lights blinking dark in an instant, her breaking back groaning apart midships, the tortured turnings of her sundered sides, rupturing the cold and riveted steel sending her to a sleep in eternal night with those lost souls held by her maiden sighs. Falling with eternity's freezing breath to rest on the bedded sea floor beneath, forever held within the darkling deep. Rusted now by 100 years and more, scattered about her frame the debris of hubris, crowned by a woman's lonely buckled shoe. That's it. Back to you, Sandy. And now we go to Larry Kirshner. Thanks for joining us tonight, Larry. Yeah, this this is my only uh, Titanic poem inspired by Sandy, no doubt. It's called Four Days Into the Journey. 
and the epigraph is, one week later, those face down in the icy fields wait for another kind of rescue. Boats for Women, Sandra Yanon. In the early hours of April 15, 1912, 370 miles south of Newfoundland, air temperature 39 degrees Fahrenheit, gray cold sea 45 degrees. Captain Smith said full speed ahead on the clear moonless star studded night, knowing there was ice in the area, but sure the three sailors on lookout in the dark would spot any floating danger in time. Having worked, having previously worked together on cargo ships, traveling from China and Europe, Ah Lam, Fang Lang, Lem Lan, Chong Fu, Chang Chip, Ling He, Li Bing, Li Ling, eight Chinese friends boarded together, listed on the same ticket as Southampton on the British steamship's first transatlantic voyage, crammed into a third-class windowless cabin in the bow of the unsinkable vessel. As in life, only 10% of the danger showed above the wintry gray waterline. The broken ship headed 12,600 feet straight down, 10 minutes, to reach a dark resting place with its crushing 3,000 atmospheres of pressure. Those passengers left in the sinking ship were surely dead after the first cold 500 feet. Lem Lan and Li Ling were greeted by Yu, Yu Quang, Chinese god of oceans, riding on two dragons. But five of the friends made it to lifeboats after apparently not understanding instructions to stay in their room until told to come out. On the rescuer's last sweep in the frigid waters with bodies face down, Bobby In a scene later, Aprio, 17 year old, hanging onto a floating wooden door. Marking the end of open borders, the US Page Act of 1875 barred, barred immigration of Chinese women into the US. But Li Ling, Li Bing, all but Li Bing were single in this group of the eight sailors on their way to Cuba, not sing, seeking the Golden Mountain but just hoping to find honest work far from the sweet crocuses of the yellow emperor and the possibility of wives and children. While most of the survivors were feted on their eventual arrival in New York City, the seven Chinese survivors were met with strong anti-Chinese sentiment, falsely accused of saving their own lives ahead of women and children by hiding in the lifeboats. Unlike others, they received no medical aid. The Brooklyn Daily Eagle called the Chinese survivors creatures who had sprung into the lifeboats, quote, at the first sign of danger and concealed themselves beneath the seats. False information spread by the Titanic owner J. Bruce Ismay, who ended up safe in a lifeboat with four of the Chinese men. Within 24 hours of arrival, after being held overnight in custody at the inspection station on Ellis Island, the Asian mariners were expelled from the country under the Chinese Exclusion Act, which barred all Chinese people from immigrating to the US in and out of the harbor, past the icon of freedom and the United States, the lady, a supposed symbol 
of welcome to all immigrants arriving by sea. A century later, during the recent pandemic, hateful anti-Asian attitudes have again been visible in the land of the free. The late president spoke belittlingly of Kung flu. Not so long ago, public health officials in the US described Chinese people as disease-ridden disease and dirty. Living in willful ignorance, hubris of putative racial superiority, and purposely induced fear of other by those who control the media, Americans appear to have no desire to walk in a different direction. Thank you. That is Larry Kirshner. And again, I will say just very quickly, that is how you put history together through time. Like you stitch all the pieces together to tell the terrible truth. Thank you, Larry Kirshner. Next, we go to Bob Shakeshaft. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bob. Great to have you. Am I left? I think so. I think so. Okay, I'm good. Justin Ham, are you with us in the room? I hope so. Yep, Justin, I'm here. great to see you. Yeah. yeah, great to see you. Good to see you too. Hey, thanks everybody for hanging on and giving us a chance to read. Um, so I don't have a Titanic poem, but um, I will point out that April 14th also happens to be um, an important date for two other tragedies. Uh, that was the day that Lincoln was shot. Um, and it's also the date of the very worst dust storm in the Dust Bowl here in the United States. So um, I don't know, a cursed date, maybe something like that. But I think what I'll read is just a short little meditation on tragedy sort of in general, if I can. So this is called Prayer to an Absent Father. Give me just a second here. Dear God of the loose dirt under my fingernails, What's happening? He's gone. Can't hear a thing. Whoa. Wow. That's amazing what he was saying about, I always notice that things happen in history and that things I'm interested in. And then I find out there's a connection to April 14th. So he was talking about how there's, there's some kind of energy vertically through time. And he's right. He's right. Um, oh my gosh, I can't believe he dropped off. Um, uh, folks, if he comes back, we're gonna go now to Rosalind Blue. We saw in we saw at Ovale. I uh, loved every minute of it. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um yeah, uh, even though I've written a poem for tonight. I feel it's not really the kind of poem that I want to do tonight because it was more like a met. I used the Titanic as a metaphor and it's a very personal poem. So I'm going to do instead a piece um, that is also on my uh, album. Um, you can see um, like day and like night. Um, I published that last year and there's 10 uh, spoken poems on it of my own um and we created 10 custom made uh, pieces. I'm not going to play the music now because that would take a long time. That would take eight minutes of, of time. Instead, I'm going to read the poem, but I'm going to give a link into the chat so that anyone who wants to can follow up on the album. And you can also find it just researching Rosalind Blue, like day and like night online. So this is a poem that I wrote way back when I was actually in the States and um, uh, we were doing, um, on an exchange year, we were doing um, in class the 
romantic writers and um, we had um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's um, Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which inspired me very much. And in the background of me, you can see an image that I created. It basically illustrates the poem that I'm going to read to you. Um, but don't worry, that creature is not something scary. Um, the poem is actually playing with the idea that maybe there is something very beautiful at the bottom of the sea. <clears throat> Down in the sunless sea. Sails disappear behind the horizon, killing his hope for life. He holds his breath, Strength floats away with the waves. Powers of water and land fight a war. Whispering wind, the voice of earthly spirit, revives the small boy's will. Do not go down to sunless sea. There is no life, no light, yet only darkness, death's domain. The water god raises his powers, whispers enchantment into the boy's mind. Calm down, let go, don't fear, come home. The lucid beauty in my domain will give you life, more than the spirit of the land. Come down, descend to light. Surrendering, the struggle of his arms exhausts. The boy gives up. Water drags him down. Earthly breath evaporates. Affected by deep silence, he sinks from combat down. Perceives no pain, no pressure as he goes. Now he feels beauty, friendly waves around him, warmth and softness, loving friends. His enemies are gone. Inviting whisper of the familiar voice allures and he accepts. Seaweed caress him in welcome. Deep down beyond the unknown sea, a light waves red. He longs to reach what looks like home, feels an ardent joy and sinks relieved into the open arms of mother animal. Indulged in love, red lights appeal, he hears the voice divinely powerful. There you are, my son, my hope, fulfilled at length, your home, down in the light of the sea. Thank you very much. Oh, I was taken down. I was taken down. Oh, that's Rosalind Blue, everyone. And we have Justin Ham back for our final poem of the evening. Thank you so much, everyone, for your patience, your generosity. Justin. What, yeah, it's wonderful of you guys to let me come back on and share this with me. So I apologize for, for getting cut off. So as I was saying, um, this one is kind of a meditation on tragedy in general. This is called Prayer to an Absent Father. Dear God of the loose dirt under my fingernails, both maker and healer of leaky heart valves, dear keeper of the secret meaning of bird song and unseen ringer of all distant bells, namer of names, scatterer of rain over corn stalks, blesser of potlucks and myriad gravies of the great Midwest, oh. dear <clears throat> knower of what we are apparently never to know, you who by definition have so many virtues, tell me why it always seems that listening isn't one. That is Thank the perfect, you, friends. That is the perfect ending to our 
Titanic commemoration this evening. I thank you all for letting us go long. You know, I do try to keep us a little tight and then I don't, and I get caught up and swept up. I got all the clamped about Titanic, as you know, and when we're here in Cove. It's just very special atmosphere. I hope by bringing Ireland to all of you and the lore and the lure and the lore of the Titanic that you were able to imbue some of the more divine stories that inhabit all of our lives, that inhabit all of our lives from our, from our ancestors to the next generations ahead as we always, always are with the sea. I want to thank our featured guests tonight. Here in the room with me was Judith Coffey from Cove and Catherine Ronan from West Cork. Thank you so much to Karen J. McDonald, John W. Sexton. And I appreciate that I got to share a few poems with you all. Folks, I normally would read the names of all the folks on the open mic, but you've been such an amazing audience um, tonight. I want to just thank each and every one of you, but I won't say names. Let's unmute and show our appreciation for every single one of our readers and listeners for being here with us tonight. Great afternoon. It was well, fantastic, yeah. Thank everybody, you so, much. so great. Thank, you. Thank you so much for being here, you know, for really bringing, bringing the love, um, bringing the respect um, about Titanic or, I mean, I love what Justin did to say, let's, 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 let's talk about tragedy in general. Like that's Titanic inspired, obviously. So I found everything so, so relevant. And that's what I think makes Titanic such a relevant metaphor for time immemorial. Um, it, still, it still allows us to, it still allows us to, um, uh, to discuss humanity and all its flaws and also to celebrate humanity and all its flaws. You know, coming to you from Cove today where we literally invoked the names of the 79 people. There's photos here of the 123 people that boarded from the White Star Line building here in Cove. And 79 of those people that you're seeing behind me did perish on Titanic. You know, being here in Cove um, uh, with with the folks that are sitting here with me, Kim and Judith and Catherine, and being down at the memorial service down on the docks near Titanic, the White Star Line building, it just does make me feel very humble when we are able to get together to um, appreciate history and appreciate ap appreciate history the past, but also the present and the future that lives within all of us. So whether or not you're a Titaniac like me, everyone brought it tonight and everyone brought the spirit of why I think the story of Titanic continues to endure. And I, I, I thank you for honoring Titanic. Um, and in that very large way you really you really honored me a lot tonight and i just want to thank that so much it's not necessary to honor me but the story the story is so deep it's so deep to me that you know you really really um were so generous with me tonight um on something that feels um so vitally important to me and i'm glad we were able to make it so relevant to all of you the poems were spectacular these poems were spectacular well next week we come back. It's, I hate to say it, it's, you know, it's poetry month, but it's our final, it's our final broadcast from Ireland. 
for now. It's just going to be me. Kim's back on the plane, heading back to the States. Welcome her this week. I'm fly I'm going to be here solo on the sea here um, for the next couple weeks and for our final program for April. But you know what it is, folks. It's the wild card open mic. I wouldn't have it any other way than wet and wild. And we'll bring it next week when you join us here on Cultivating Voices Live Poetry. I believe it's going to be so wild. I don't even know where we're going to be joining you from. I'm not sure. But I'll show up from somewhere in Ireland and we'll have a rousing good night of poetry. And on that note, I say a very good night to all of you from Cove. Folks, take very good care of yourselves. Take exceptionally good care of your beloveds. And of course, keep writing those Titanic poems. I'll see you next week. This is Sandy Eno from Cove, Ireland. Light a candle tonight for all the souls. Good night, Sandy. Good night, everybody. Thank you for a lovely evening of poetry.